The previous chapter talked about moving magnetic fields in a stationary conducting ring. Now we're going to flip it around a bit and we're going to have a stationary magnetic field in a moving conductor. So here it is. We have this magnetic field here B that is coming out of the page, out of the picture towards you. Now we know that what's really important here is a change in flux and the change in flux will induce an EMF. And you can have that flux changing either by a changing magnetic field or a changing area. So let's look at this picture. We have a loop of wire here. We have a stationary magnetic field. And we have this little bar here, this little metal conducting bar. And what we're going to do is push it with an external force. And it's going to move in this direction with a velocity v. And as you can see, we're, ex we're increasing the area that this loop has and therefore we're increasing the area exposed to the magnetic field because we only consider the magnetic field inside the loop. So if we push this, we know the distance traveled is V delta T. Well, that's just from uh, mechanics where V is the distance over the change in time. So we can say the distance is V delta T. And then this increase in area, this whole section here, you can see where the uh, the slide started here and then the bar moved over to here. This whole area would be V delta T, which is how much it's increased in the X direction, times L, which is the Y component. So the change in area of this bar rail combination due to someone or something pushing it would be L times V delta T. Since the magnetic flux is changing, we can use Faraday's law to find the EMF induced in this circuit, the circuit containing the rail and the bar. And N is the number of loops. Well, we just have one, so N will get replaced by one. And we're going to look at the flux here, which is BA. And in this case, B is constant. However, the area is changing. And we found on the previous page that delta A is LV delta T. So we substitute that in. And quite nicely, the delta T's come out. And we have the EMF induced is the, the strength of the magnetic field times the length, which is the vertical height of this combination, and the velocity at which the bar is moving. The negative sign states that the induced EMF will be in a direction that creates a current that generates a magnetic field that opposes the increasing magnetic flux. So if you remember from the previous slide, the flux was coming out of the board. So here's our little current here, or a little circuit loop. Here's the bar that's moving to the right. So is this, if this is increasing, which it is, we need a current that will oppose that increase. So using the right hand rule, I put my thumb in this direction, and you can see how my, the fingers inside the loop will curl downwards. So that verifies that I did choose the right direction from the current, and you will have a current flow like that. The direction of the induced EMF as mandated by Lenz's law, is necessary to be in agreement with the law of the conservation of energy. That was mentioned earlier, but we really didn't show the reasoning for it. This example with the sliding bar is a perfect example. For example, let's assume the current flowed, the induced current flowed in the counterclockwise direction. So if it did, that would generate a magnetic field within the loop that came out of the board and would add to the increasing magnetic flux due to the area covered by the expanding loop. So we would be getting more magnetic flux from the external field, and also we'd be getting more magnetic flux and greater magnetic field from the induced current. So now I have a greater magnetic field, which would increase the force on the charges due to the magnetic field. F is equal to QV times B. We'll go over that in a couple slides. And then an increased force, we get an increased acceleration of the bar, the sliding bar. And that basically violates the law of conservation of energy because we could just tap the bar and then when it would keep increasing in acceleration. It would accelerate faster and faster with no other force added to it, which does violate the conservation of energy. However, in the real world, you would have to put a constant force on that bar to keep it moving and generate an EMF. So we'll show how that force de derivation of the EMF works here. Here's a simplified picture of what we showed on the previous couple slides. Uh, here's the magnetic field, the external magnetic field. 
Here's the bar that we gave a push to, so it has a velocity off to the right direction. Now, using the right hand rule, there's a magnetic force on the positive charges in this bar that will go downwards. Right? You would put your four fingers in the direction of the velocity, you'd curl them out of the page, and you'd find a magnetic force going down. So once that happens, the positive charge is gathered down here, which leaves negative charges up here, and now we have an electric field. We've separated charges. So we have an electric force in the positive y direction. Once the rod is moving in constant velocity and the charges are in equilibrium, they're spread as far apart as they can get, then we have by Newton's law, the sum of these two forces will equal zero. So the electric force, which is in the up direction, minus the magnetic force equals ma. They're not moving anymore. These charges aren't moving, so that's zero. Continuing the derivation from the previous page, this is where we left off. The sum of the forces is the force through the electric field minus the force through the magnetic field equal to zero. We know that force electric field is QE. Force magnetic field is QVB. So we put them in, we put QVB on the other side, we divide through by Q, and we come up with this equation here, the electric field is equal to the velocity of the bar times the magnetic field. Now we're going to use another derivation we came up in the previous chapter, where if you have a uniform electric field, that the voltage is equal to the electric field times the separation. So in this case, that separation between the negatives up here and the positives here is L, so the electric field will be voltage over L, and for voltage here we'll be using E, the induced EMF. We substitute into this equation right here, and then look at this, we come up with EMF is BLV, just as we came up with earlier. We found the magnitude of the induced EMF, which here is E is equal to BLV, we'll be in there. And what's nice is that's exactly what we found when we use Faraday's law. So it's nice when two different ways of analyzing something come up with the same answer. Now we find the direction of the induced current. Well, we built up the positive charges here. The negative charges are all built up there. So if we complete the circuit here, for example, if there is a resistance here, a little resistor, we now have a complete path for charges to flow. Charges always go from positive to minus. That's the flow of conventional current. And you can see what we have here is a clockwise flow of current. Again, the exact same thing that we obtained using Faraday's law.